Welcome into the Bobcast, everybody. This Bobcast for the week of the 19th of February. I'm Dan Wallace with you once again. And my first guest today, joined by men's basketball head coach, Webb Hatch. Coach, a good week for your for your team, and, and it, you qualify for the Capital Athletic Conference Tournament. We'll, get, we'll dive deep into what's going on there in just a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the week that was, and, and we start with the game at Southern Virginia. A little bit of, of a rough game for, for your team down in Buena Vista, but I, I think you kind of knew from what Southern Virginia showed you here the first time around, taking you to overtime. It took a great comeback from your team in that game to win that game that it was going to be very, very hard to travel all the way down to Southern Virginia and get the win. Well, they're very good at home. Um, and like you said, we had a close game against them here. Um, unfortunately, we didn't shoot the ball well. We only shot 35% for the game and only 23% on threes. And that was basically the difference in, in winning and losing the ball game. Um, you know, they they zoned us quite a bit. And, um, you know, we, we knew that would be a problem. So, um we were disappointed, but I was proud of the fact that uh, we bounced back and uh-huh. took care of business on Saturday. Saturday was, in my opinion, one of the best overall performances, most well put together performances that your team has had this season. And a 91 74 victory over Wesley. You got to be extremely happy with what your team showed. They came, they brought it from start to finish. You had one stretch in the second half where Wesley started to climb back into it, but for the majority of the game, your team just held a firm control over the pace, over the play of the game. Yeah, we had, um, I was looking at assist, uh, 65.7% of our shots came off assist. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, yeah, you know, I think in the NBA, Golden State's leading the NBA at about 70% of their shots come off assist. So the college game obviously is a little different, but I thought that was a, a key to our win. Um, you know, we got down early. Um, we started five seniors because um, it was senior day, and a couple of the guys who started don't get a tremendous amount of playing time. I think we got down 6 nothing, mm-hmm. But then we we made some subs, and we came back, and we, we took the lead. And I, I don't think we ever trailed once mm-hmm. we finally got the no. lead. Um and they did make a run at us in the second half, and we were forced to play a lot of man-to-man in the second half after switching it up and playing zone and man in the first half. But I thought um, it was one of our better games as far as the players paid attention. They were focused. We had a game plan. Uh, we knew who their key players were. We went out and guarded them. Uh, and then we were very unselfish on offense. We moved the ball. Yeah, and we shot the ball fairly well. We wound up shooting 53% for the game mm-hmm. uh, and 33% on threes and 78% from the free throw line. So uh, it was one of our better performances over the year. And one of the better performances, I think, from, from Edwin Cole that day as well. 23 points for him. He's been a double-double machine for your team this season. He didn't hit the double-double mark on Saturday, only six rebounds, but – offensively his game has kind of gone to a new level this season. What have you seen from him in terms of improvement from last year to this year? And he should be primed for a very big senior year next year. Well, he's, you know, he's bigger, faster, stronger, and quicker. <laughs> uh, you know, he spent the entire summer up here, um, you know, had a job, lived up here, was in the gym just about every day, came over to the weight room on a consistent basis. Um, uh, and he, you know, he only played one year of high school basketball. So he was pretty raw when he came here as a freshman. So he's a really evolved. I'm guessing 23 points, that's mm-hmm. his career yeah. high as far as points. I know he's averaging 10 and a half, 10 and a half for us. Uh, and we, we've we put a emphasis on trying to get him the ball on the low post more and getting him because he's shooting 50% from the floor. So we'd like for him to get – 10 to 14 shots every night uh and there were some nights when he only gets about six or eight so he had 11 on saturday and went seven for 11 he's a very good free throw shooter uh, i'm looking here he was nine for 11 from the free throw line mm-hmm. so <clears throat> he's when he stays out of foul trouble um uh, he's he's a big part of our game mm-hmm. uh, and you know a couple of games he's gotten in foul trouble and we've had some issues but um, he only had he had zero fouls on saturday so. About a 68% shooter on the season is Edwin Cole from the free throw line. It was 
senior day for your squad. Of course, Edwin, not one of those seniors. You had you had six of them from top to bottom. Tyler Michael, Jeff McMorris, uh, Darren Campbell, Dalton Goss, Jordan Johnson, Chris Costin. Those guys are, are done after this year. A few of them you've seen from, from start to finish. Those six, that collective of players, what, what has that group of players meant to to you and to this Frostburg State program in the time that they've been here? Well, the four guys that have been in the program for four years, uh, Chris, Tyler, Dalton, and Jeff, uh, they've been good teammates. They've all improved over the course of their time here. Uh, they've, bought, they've bought into the some of the things that you emphasize that aren't necessarily about basketball, about trying to be good citizens and good people. Uh, and Darren Campbell's been in our program for three years, and Jordan joined us this year. So they're all quality guys. We haven't had any issues with them off the floor in their time here. They're all solid students. Several of them are exceptional students, and they take their academics seriously. But, you know, we've said this many times. The thing that, that's helpful uh, – is when they're juniors and seniors mm-hmm. from the first day of practice, they understand what's going on because we haven't changed a whole lot of what we're doing. And you can you can say a drill, and they immediately go know what that drill is. You know, you you have an offensive set that you that they've been running for two or three or four years. They know the offensive set. They know rotations on defense. So those are obviously wonderful things for a coach. And we're not like some of the major Division One programs where they're getting kids that come in for one year and then they're gone. To the NBA, uh, so I think successful Division three programs and the, the successful mid-major D ones, as they call them, mm-hmm. usually have three or four seniors on their team mm-hmm. who get better, and and that that shows up. So that's been great for us. Now I know you, for the most part you don't like making things about you, but it was also your last game at Bob Katarina on Saturday, and you come away with the win over Wesley. Could you have really, in reality, if, if you ever pictured it in your head, your final game as, as a collegiate head coach, could you have asked for any better way to go out th- than the way things happened on Saturday? Yeah, it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> we had ten former players here, um, so that was nice. Um, and the guys seemed to be really focused. And, you know, they had the T-shirts they gave out that had thanks web on them, and that was neat. Uh, and so it was a – it ended about as well as it could end, <laughs> and um, fortunately, we get to play another one, mm-hmm. uh, and, and hopefully more than just one more. So, yes, it it, this, it we couldn't have scripted it much better. Uh, obviously, there is a possibility that you could still have one more home game. It's a long shot, but if you and Wesley were to both reach the CAC championship, there would be one more game at Bob Arena. That would have to be everything, a perfect storm for that to happen, but... Let's take a look now at the, the, the CAC field, the, the championship field as it sits right now. And, and the way things look is, is Christopher Newport is the number one seed, and York sits right behind them at, at number two. The three is Salisbury. You're headed to Mary Washington to play the four seed. You are the five, and the six is Wesley. Obviously, you don't really want to talk about anything past Tuesday because you got to get past Tuesday first. So as a whole, as a collective of this field, what is your outlook on the field, and uh, uh, what do you think – How do you? What kind of ability do you think your team has to make some noise in a CAC that has been absolute chaos this year? Well, I mean, we've we've split with everybody but Salisbury. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're the only team that beat us twice, um, and we beat Penn State Harrisburg twice. twice. Yep. Um, so we know we can play with everybody, mm-hmm. um, and we won at Murray Washington uh, and lost to them here. So we're not going down to Mary Wash, you know, totally intimidated with Well, we never win here. We, you know, we played very well there in early January. So that it's a winnable game. The question mark is can you defend them? They, they make almost ten threes a game. Uh, so we've got to get out and defend them and hopefully hold them below ten. And they, they've got a couple of players that have played real well against us over the years, so we've got to be ready to guard them. I don't expect it's going to be a low-scoring game. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think they're going to score points, and hopefully we'll shoot the ball well and we'll score. So um, we'll mix it up defensively, and, you know, we'll we'll see some man and zone from them. I think we might be a little deeper than they are 
personnel wise uh, so hopefully that might pay off for us and over the course of the game um, CNU has a first round bye you know so whoever wins the Murray Murray Washington Frostburg game has got to go there on mm-hmm. Thursday um, and we'll deal with that when we have to deal with that yeah. um, so it's I think anybody could win the tournament obviously the top two seeds are favored one they get a first round bye two they never have to you know they don't have to leave home mm-hmm. until the championship um, but we're excited to be in it after not being in it for I think the last four or five years and the last time we win the tournament we played Murray Washington in a first round game and it was a very 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 close game and we had a chance to win it right at the end and mm-hmm. weren't able to get a shot to go down so you've seen this Mary Washington team twice already. You've seen everybody twice with the format that the Capital Athletic Conference plays during their conference schedule. Knowing that you split one and one and you and you won at Mary Washington, is there anything that you look to change, anything look that you look to do differently than you did in the first two games against the Mary Washington team you're going to see on Tuesday? No, we'll pretty much do the same thing. We know things that we have to key on that we have to be ready for. They they set a lot of ball screens. So we have to be able to guard ball screens. You know, we might do a couple little things differently at times just to see if that can upset them. Uh, they also do a real good job of, of running a high-low against our 2-1-2 two, two zone. So we've got a, uh, they've got a kid named Cronin who's had two very good games against us. And he sets up in the short corner against the zone, and they do a good job of getting him the ball. So we've got to be, be ready to yeah. guard him and take away that. But we're not going to do anything a, a whole lot different. It, it, uh, the bottom line eventually gets down, you know, can you guard them? Yeah. And can you make shots? Mm-hmm. This is a is a trip, and, and you and I were kind of talking about it before we started here, that if there's somewhere that you're going to go for this tournament, this is probably the best place you could have gotten. It's probably the easiest trip. It's probably the shortest trip. And you're coming off of, of shorter rest than normal playing on Tuesday. It'd be Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday instead of uh, the typical Wednesday, Saturday format that the Capital Athletic Conference plays during the regular season. As a coach, are you is that kind of a good thing to, to kind of have that sort of format where you, you don't get to sit around, think about as, as uh, the previous game as much. You get right back into it if you win on Tuesday for Thursday. You only get one day of preparation. Do you prefer that the quick turnaround like that, or is it better to have those extra days? Would you prefer to have those extra days rather than playing every other day? I'd like to have um, an extra day simply because of the travel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, we don't have any close games. Uh, our, our closest trip uh-huh. is either Marymount or uh, Murray Washington, you know, which are two and a half to three hour trips. So it'd be nice if we had an extra day, but it is what it is. This mm-hmm. is the format that we have, and this is what we have to live with. And you know, we'll, we're we're happy to be playing, so we'll make <laughs> the most of it, and then we'll deal with it from game to game. But you know, the, it did work out as good as it could work out because we could have had to go to Salisbury, yep. or we could have had to go to Christopher Newport, and those are almost five-hour trips for us. Mm -hmm. Well, Coach, best of luck to you on Tuesday. Hopefully we see you playing all the way through Saturday and well, and longer than that. We're not ready to see your career end yet. I don't know about you, but we want to see you coaching. We want to see you on that Bobcat bench for at least a few more games. So best of luck to you on Tuesday, and hopefully we talk to you next week after a uh, Capital Athletic Conference championship. That sounds like a good way to do it to me. Thank you. I'm joined now by head women's basketball coach, Carrie Saunders. Coach, you're Squad back in the CAC tournament, second straight year. This time you're headed to York. We'll get to that game in, in just a few minutes. But first we need to talk about, about what happened this week. And the first game, the opening game of the week, you head down to, to Southern Virginia, a team that, that caught you here at, at Bob Arena. It wasn't one of your best performances from your squad. It was a 79-59 loss. It had to feel good to go down to Southern Virginia, play a much better game, and, and avenge that loss that you suffered on your home floor. Yeah, um, we were we were definitely ready to go go down and, and play Southern Virginia. Um, we were we did not play well um, when when they came up here and we didn't shoot the ball well and um, you know it just wasn't wasn't a great night for us. So um, our team was definitely had that that game you know circled on our schedule to to go down there and get a little revenge. Um, and it ended up being a, a pretty big game for us. Um, and yeah, we played well. We played very well start to finish. It seemed like that was kind of a game that got 
Victoria Big digs back into her groove. We, we saw her for a couple games go a bit quiet, mm -hmm. 22 points in that one. She had another big game later in the week against Wesley. We'll talk about that game in a minute. If her game is on, your team runs. If it's not, sometimes your offense kind of slows down a bit. Everybody in this, this conference knows that when it comes to scoring, she, she's your big horse. She's mm -hmm. the one who's going to pour in the majority of your points. What kind of effect does that have when her offense isn't clicking on your team as a whole? It, sometimes when your best player is not clicking, it's hard for the rest of the team to pick it up. Yeah, I mean, you know, that, that comes with, you know, the nature of the beast of, of being a leading scorer is, you know, you're going to have off nights and um, the rest of the team, you know, has to pick up that scoring slack. But, I you know, I think we've done a good job of mm -hmm. um, different people stepping up on different nights. Um, the addition of Kayla and her points, um, you know, Meg's getting back, you know, from the flu and, and starting to hit again. And, um, you know, our front court, Amber, um, you know, she's she's given us really good minutes here here recently. So, um, yeah, I think we're doing a good job of, of, um, balancing out our scoring, especially when, when Diggs isn't quite hitting. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, scoring needs to come from, from top to bottom, especially this time of the year. Um, you can't rely on, you know, one person, um, one individual. So, uh, yeah, we've, we've done a really good job of, I think, balancing out our scoring within the last, last few weeks. That second game of the week was a game at home, the final game of the regular mm -hmm. season. You take on the Wesley Wolverines, a game that in reality really didn't mean much for either side. You were mm -hmm. stuck in sixth place either way. Wesley was, was out of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. The one big thing to focus on really from that game was it was Ajwa Pinker's senior day. Mm -hmm. She was This is her final game at Bobcat Arena, and 13 points for her. Could you really have asked for, for much more from her to, to see her have a, a very, very good performance on her last game at home? No, and it's so great to see, you know, Aj is is a kid that never likes the spotlight and never really um, wants all of that attention. Um, so I could tell she was a little bit uncomfortable in the beginning um, just because it, it is all eyes on her. It's her senior day, and being the lone senior kind of intensifies that. Um, but she she did a really great job. Um, she found a rhythm within herself, um, you know, after a few minutes into the game, and, and she played very, very well. Um, I was very happy for her you know, in front of her family and her friends and um, being able to close out her career on on our home floor um, and then being able to carry that over into playoffs. Um, so it, it's always nice to have your very last regular season game at home and, and being able to honor her and, um, you know, and she played well. So there's there's no better way to have a senior night. Well, being that she's your only senior, she doesn't, she may not like the spotlight, but she's going to get a little bit of it right <laughs> here. She's She's had her, her career here with you her four years. What has she meant to you, and what has she meant to this women's basketball program in her time here at Frostburg State? You know, she, she's meant a lot um, to to me and, and our program. Um, she was a freshman my first year as head coach, um, and we've kind of grown a little bit together within this program, and she's helped pave the way and, you know, what we do and what we don't do in this program. And, um you know, she's, she's a quiet kid for the most part, but she plays big. Um, and you know, there's, there's not, there's, there's not enough, you know, great things that I can say about her, um, her size and her depth and her, her versatility, all of those things throughout her four years has really allowed her, um, to be the player that she is now. Um, and, and it's not over yet. So that's, that's the most exciting part. You got the the seventy seven seventy one win over Wesley on Saturday, but there, there's no hiding really that you weren't happy with your performance, the performance of your team uh, in that second half of that game. Wesley only shot the ball at about twenty five percent in the in the first half. Mm -hmm. They shot it at over fifty percent in the second half. What changed between that first and that second half of the game, and what do you guys have to change to get a win at, at York on Tuesday? Yeah, I mean, we I said that at halftime. I, you know, we walked down and I said, man, I'm really interested to see what they're shooting because they're getting they're getting good shots. They're just not going in, which mm -hmm. is why we we were able to build that that big lead. And we talked about that at halftime. I said halftime is where you regroup, and that's exactly what they did. They regrouped. Um, we got a little comfortable, and um, so yeah, you know, I, I wasn't happy because you know, in order to become a better, stronger team, you have to be consistent no matter who you're playing. You have to be consistent for 40 minutes. That's how you grow as a team and as a program. Um, and so, you know, I talked to them after the game about holding ourselves to a higher standard um, and being able to 
play with a lead and still bring that intensity and, you know, not look back type of thing. Um, so, you know, it was a good win for us, mm-hmm. you know, bottom line, which is, which is what I said in the locker room. But um, in order for us to grow, we have to realize that we can't, we can't give up that, that lead that we, that we built and that we worked so hard for in the first half um, that quickly. Um especially moving on to, into playoffs, you got to play 40 minutes. Um, so, but otherwise, you know, it was a good win. It was a good win on Saturday. Before we dig into that game on Tuesday, because we really can't, you know, usually we take an outlook of, of what's going on throughout your whole week. Well, this, this, this CAC tournament, it, it happens all in one week. So we're mm-hmm. not going to get to talk about the other games should you win on Tuesday. So mm-hmm. let, let's start with the, the field as a whole. Of course, the field is Marymount sits as the one seed. Newport is the two. They get the automatic buys. York is the three. You will head to York as the sixth seed. Mm-hmm. And then the other matchup is Mary Washington and Salisbury down in Fredericksburg. As a whole, what is your outlook being the sixth seed in this tournament of the field, and what kind of noise do you think your team can make in this in this championship? You know, I'm I'm fine with with where we are. Um, you know, I'm the the way that our season has go has gone with injuries and illnesses, and you know that huge stretch in there where we didn't have our you know original starting lineup, even top seven mm-hmm. for six eight games. Um, you know, I, I'm happy that we're here. Um, and I know my team is very, very ready to go play York. Um, you know, the first time we played them, we dropped a close one there. And then the second time we played them, they came here and we only had eight healthy players. Yep. And, you know, we gave it our all. Um, so we kind of are still looking for that little revenge. And, and they they ended our season last year. So there's, there's a ton of stuff that falls in, into play here. Um, so... We're ready. Um, you know, we're we're happy with with where we are and in the road ahead. Um, mm-hmm. But we have to take it one game at a time and, and get ready for tomorrow. Of course, that road ahead is should you win at York on Tuesday. Thursday would be a matchup with Christopher Newport. Mm-hmm. Saturday would be the CAC championship game. We can't really talk about those. I'm sure you don't really want to talk <laughs> about the possibilities of what could happen. Mm-hmm. We got to get through Tuesday first. So focusing on Tuesday, you already mentioned York did get the better of you twice. Mm-hmm. Well kind of a mantra in sports is the fact that it's hard to beat the same team three times in one year. It's Mm -hmm. very hard to beat the same team three times in a single season, and York's already gotten you twice. So Mm -hmm. you've had a very good look at this York team. You know what they're capable of. You now have somewhat of a formula of how they're going to play. What does your team need to do to travel to York on Tuesday night and get a victory, head to the semifinals? Yeah, you know, we we have to be ready. Um, that's the biggest thing is is be ready to play for forty minutes. Um, you know, they make a run, we make a run. Whatever happens, we have to stay composed. We go up a certain amount, they go up a certain amount, um, and and we have to be able to um, get through the ups and downs of, of a basketball game, especially a playoff basketball game on the road. Um, but we got to focus on ourselves today in practice. You know, we we'll go over the scouting report. But you know, again, we're familiar with this team. When we go over things that you know, they're going to be um, things that we have seen in the past. Um, but just a refresher. Any any of the new things that they're doing now. Um, so the biggest thing is to focus on the task at hand um, and whether. Um, you know, they throw something new at us. We throw something new at them. You know, you gotta, you gotta adapt to the game, um, and, and be focused because at this point out, it's, um, you know, win or go home. So we got to be ready. Um, today we got to have a good practice. You know, it's a short turnaround, you know, you play Saturday and first rounds on a Tuesday. Um, so we got a lot to do today, um, to, to get prepared, but, but we'll be ready. Sometimes I think you're reading my mind a little bit because that was what was coming next was about that short turnaround. It's it's a weird format when you're used to playing Wednesday, Saturday, mm-hmm. Wednesday, Saturday throughout the conference season, and instead you get a short turnaround start on a Tuesday, you win, you then play Thursday, you mm-hmm. win again, you play on Saturday only on a day's rest each time. Mm-hmm. As a coach, yeah, it, it's a little bit lesser rest for your players, but do you maybe enjoy that sort of format and, and not have as much time to think about what may have happened the day before and just get right back out there and play again? Yeah, you know um... – it, you know, it's nice in a way, you know, as far as rest, recovery, injury, you know, that type of thing, you know, you kind of kind of just got to roll with the punches and um, go light if you have to, you know, day before. Um, but, you know, when you hit this time as an athlete and as a program and as a coach and as a player, uh, you're ready. Mm-hmm. You know, it doesn't all of the all of the little nagging things in your body, the soreness, all of it should go out the window because um, you're a competitor and you um, 
you're going to do whatever it takes. If you have to play, you know, back to back days, that's what, that's what you do to win. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is, is, um, you know, this is the next, next phase. You know, I talked about it earlier, um, on the, on the program that, you know, a college basketball season goes in phases because there's so many, you know, before Christmas, after Christmas, yep. second round, you know, you see teams, um, and this is kind of that next phase, turn, turn the page and, and, and let's go type of thing. So we're going to be ready. Um, you know, again, got a lot of work to do today to get prepared, but, but we'll be ready. Well, best of luck to you coach on Tuesday, hopefully on Thursday, hopefully on <laughs> Saturday. Yes. And hopefully we're talking to you again next Monday after a CAC championship. Yeah, That'd be great. I'm joined now by head track and field coach Dale Louie. Coach your team down to Christopher Newport this past weekend for the for the CAC championships. And and before we get into to what actually we actually happened with the with the CAC championships, I just want to talk to you a little bit about how this may be different from a normal meet. I know you've had some big meets in terms of the number of teams and everything, but you're seeing all ten Capital Athletic Conference teams at one place at one time. There's a ton of athletes there. How is that any different from from just say a normal meet on a normal weekend? Well, uh, it, it's a scoring meet, and most of the meets uh, we are in are not scoring meets. So that's you know that's one big difference, and and obviously you're trying to to do as well as you can in 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 your conference. Uh, you know, all year long you've been kind of, or you should be, you know, if you're an athlete, <laughs> checking uh, performance list of you know your competitors, uh, not only throughout the region and nationally in some cases, but obviously you 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 really looking at your your conference uh, foes, so to speak, and and. You're then at the point at Christopher Newport where it's all right. How can I do you know versus these people? Let's let's start with the the men. What happened with the men over the weekend? And and some of your athletes had some some good, really good numbers. Uh, I want to start, of course, with, with John Kearns because he did medal. His improvement has been vast this year. He's already on the medal stand in just his sophomore year and has two more years to go. I mean, we we could be looking at a future CAC champion by the time he's done here. Uh, and that's true. Uh, you know, you, of course, never know what other teams, uh, you know, bring in and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we could even bring in at some point in time. But, you know, if he continues to progress, he'll be in a good spot, uh, you know, down the road by the time he's, uh, you know, senior. And that's what you're preaching to your athletes all the time. You know, keep working on it. Uh, some people have technique to work on. Some people have strength to work on. Some people have a lot of things to work on. But, uh, you know, if they keep working at it, uh, you know, one of the beauties of this sport is is that it's it's kind of a measurement, uh, every single mm -hmm. effort sport. So you you can get some uh, really uh, objective feedback. Other guys really performed well as t uh, as well. Shamar Nelson, season best, ECAC qualifying times in, in both the 60 and the 200 he is he's very good at everything he does and he he just seems to be your most versatile athlete uh he is in some ways i'm kind of chuckling at that because uh, uh although i'm sure he'll never do the decathlon we we've been uh uh joking around with him uh, uh about doing that because mm -hmm. he he has uh he's a really good example of somebody who's come in here and uh you know really has progressed and and continues to work at it, and he cares about uh, his performances. And, you know, you kind of hope a guy like that, you know, rubs off on, mm -hmm. on his teammates and things. Uh, really uh, impressive in the sprints. Uh, you know, he, he exceeded his, his seeds tremendously. In the 200, uh, the time he ran was, was even more remarkable because he had an inside lane, which is very difficult in the sprints to, uh, uh, you know, to, to get a good time running off of that inside lane. Uh, so a really remarkable, uh, you know, weekend for him. I know he's a little disappointed in the, in the long jump, but, uh, you know, uh, he, he made finals. He picked some points up for us there as well. Other guys like Robbie Romano, a fifth-place finish in the mile as well. Christian Healy, uh, he had a top-ten finish, a sixth-place finish in the, in, a, in the triple jump in a, in a season-best performance for him. I think the nice thing for you going into next season – with this team even is the fact that you really don't have a senior heavy class, especially on the men's side this year. A lot of these guys who are your top performers are going to be back on the indoor side next year. Uh, that's, that's right. You know, that's something to look forward to. And, and uh, you know, some of the struggles we've had this year is, is that, you know, we are uh, very heavily loaded uh, in that freshman, sophomore, or even sometimes first time out uh, on our team and stuff. And, uh, 
you know, Christian had a really good meet. Uh, uh, you know, he uh, put it together in the finals there, uh, moved up a couple spots in the finals. Uh, and that's one of our mantras, you know, first thing is make it to the finals. And then, you know, you got, you got three more chances there. So he, he practiced that philosophy to the T very well. Uh, Robbie Romano, uh, uh, if folks can go back and, and look at the video of the DMR and his anchor leg, uh, he literally had to place rocking and rolling. Uh, you know, he ran a, an outstanding mile uh, leg, uh, led those guys at ECAC qualifying, uh, came from way, way back, uh, very briefly uh, actually took the lead uh, and uh, and then held, held on for, for third spot there. And, and uh, it was, was kind of interesting at the hotel, uh, riding the elevator, there was a uh, some athletes from another team, and they, they saw we were wearing Frostburg, and like, man, we really got into that uh, DMR last night. Your guy was really, <laughs> really rocking and rolling and stuff. So, uh, you know, it was, it was very exciting for Robbie. It it uh, it probably hurt him a little bit to coming back the next day to run the mile, uh, but he still came back and, and, and ran a, a season-best converted time uh, in, in the mile there individually, which is, is, is impressive, you know, to, to run two – top-notch, you know, miles uh, back-to-back. Not easy to do. Let's switch things over now to the, the women's side for a second. And Kayla Truesdale just continues to defy what we think is is possible with her. She goes now and sets the, the CAC indoor meet record for the 200 meter. I mean, is there anything that you've found so far that this girl can't do? <laughs> uh, you know, she... Uh, she also continues to progress, and, and uh, uh, for a sprinter, the amount of time that she's knocked off of every event that she's been in has, has been quite impressive, and uh, uh, I think she'll be the first one to tell you that uh, there are aspects of her races that she can continue to work on, uh, and so the plus there is, is that there should be continued improvement still. Uh, so, uh, you know, she hasn't hit her ceiling. Uh, and I, I think uh, uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, couple weeks here for her. Uh, hopefully she makes it into Nationals. Right now she's sitting in a good spot in, in the 60 and the 200. And, and uh, you know, hopefully she can build on her performances and, and lock some spots up at the championship. And, of course, we're not done seeing her this, this indoor season. She will be at the AC, ECAC championships along with athletes like John Kearns and Destiny Logan. Uh, and, of course, we'll, we'll most likely see her at the, at the NCAA championships for the indoor schedule as well. So she was also uh, a part of, of the 4x400-meter relay team that, that won the AC, ECAC crown in, in that event this year. Her, Kayleen Estrada, Destiny Logan, Madison Watson. It's been a strong group for you this season. What goes into deciding who is going to be a part of that, that relay team? Because – you know, one one leg is off on those relays, and and the entire team goes down. What goes into to deciding who is going to be paired with who, and what goes into putting together such a strong relay squad? Uh, well, those are some good insights because uh, time alone is is not why you run on on a relay team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so uh, you know we're looking for uh, consistency, uh, along with you know times, obviously. Uh, we're looking for uh, individuals who can perhaps run certain legs, you know, as, as well. Uh, you know, we, uh, we we have Destiny Logan on our second leg for, for one very good reason. You know, Destiny will go after people. So it it's, doesn't much matter, you know, where we are in the race. Uh, you know, she will chase. Uh, she's had an exceptional year. She, she had an exceptional weekend, uh, brought her times down tremendously. Uh, she gets overlooked a little bit in her sprint crew with, you know, with Kayla's accomplishments and things. Uh, but the, the, the thing that was interesting at CAC with the, the relay is uh, uh, Destiny put us out ahead by, by, by quite a bit. Uh, and so we had a, a first-year runner there, Maddie Watson, who uh, has not run a lot of 400s in her life, has not run a lot of, you know, 1,600-meter uh, relays in her life. And she was put in a spot of having a pretty decent lead. And there was no doubt that she recognized the pressure there. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I give her a lot of credit because uh, she she ran uh, very smart, uh, held that lead for us, and, and put Kayla in a, uh, an exceptional spot. So, you know, the time we ran uh, uh, was, was a very good time. Uh, the other thing that's uh, kind of interesting is, is that 
uh, we were actually ahead uh, when when Kayla got that baton, mm-hmm. and uh, and she continued to push it. You know, she ran a uh, a 57 something uh, split there for us, which is kind of an exceptional uh, 400 time. Logan also in the process took second in, in the 400 meter. That seems to be her her bread and butter this season. Whether it be on the relay or it be individually, it seems like she's really taking control of that event this season. And we'll see her running that event again at the ECACs. Yes, we will. Uh, and as I said earlier, I mean she's she's had a great senior year here. Uh, the ability has always been there. The consistency hasn't been there. Uh, you know, some of that has been due to some injuries and things. And she's learned how to manage her body, I think. Uh, and uh, uh, she has just really had it cranked up. And uh, I'll tell you something. Uh, before she uh, stepped out onto that track there uh, in that relay, uh, the two of us had a little bit of eye contact. And, and uh, you know, she knew she was going to be behind when she got that. And you know, I just think there was a little bit of, you know, we both knew what she had to do, and we mm-hmm. both knew she was going to do it, and she did. So now that the, the CAC championship meet is, is behind us, the indoor schedule for the most part outside of the ECAC's last chance meet and stuff next weekend are pretty much done for, for the most part for the majority of your athletes. Between last year and, and now to this year, what do, looking back on it, where do you think, where do you believe in your own opinion that this – Frostburg State track and field program now stands compared to where it was a year ago? Well, I'll be honest with you, we're actually weaker than we were a year ago. Uh, you know, we, we don't have some of the, the depth, uh, you know, showed up in some of our scoring at the conference meet. Uh, and a lot of that is we, we've had a little bit of a changing of the guard, uh, uh, not only in terms of athletes, but in terms of coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and that has an impact. Uh, uh, on the plus side, our, our numbers continue to be well. Uh, you know, we, I, I think the, uh, the depth that we have in terms of the numbers of people on our team really has shown up in the, in the relay performances of the last couple of years and including this year it, it's, uh, you know, we may not have the people that can take the first places, the second places, maybe even score in some of the individual events, but what we have shown ourselves capable of doing the last several years in the CAC is putting some some you know top two scoring relay teams in our men's DMR this year uh, took a big step up and, and taking third and and uh, uh, so that is a good sign you know for our mm-hmm. program and hopefully we can you know we can build on that. Well, coach, thanks for talking to us again. Congratulations on on your success at the CAC. Good luck to all your athletes at the ECAC and the NCAA. And people better get used to hearing your voice because we're not done with you yet. We have the outdoor season coming up in just a couple weeks, so we'll talk to you again. Thank you. I'm joined now by men's and women's head swim coach Justin Anderson. Coach, your, your squad headed to the, the CAC championships this upcoming weekend. Before we, we dive into to all the, the all, everything that goes into the CAC meet, it's been a little while since you guys have swam. Your last, your last meet was two weekends ago at this point, really, against Marymount. How difficult is it to, to go that amount of time without swimming competitively. I know you say that you guys compete against each other every day in the pool and practice and everything, but there's a little bit of a different atmosphere between competing in the pool against your teammates and being at a big championship meet like this. Yeah, for the athletes mostly, it's, it's more difficult mentally than anything else at this point. Um, physically, not racing people isn't as big of a deal. It's just kind of like where am I and speed-wise during this taper period. Um, athletes tend to get a little anxious and, and are ready to, to see where they're at. Um, so more than anything else, it's just getting through the nerves of knowing that the work we've done all season is going to lead to really fast swimming when we do get to championships and, and we're fully tapered and shaved and rested and ready to go. So you, you get to the CAC championship meet. It's a, it's a little different than than anything else you, you've dealt with for the most part. You did have the, the Franklin and Marshall invite, which was a multi-day meet. Uh, earlier this season this is a, a little bit of a different beast it's 10 10 schools not 10 make it seven schools that are there one pool four days in a row how taxing is that not just physically on the athletes but but mentally four straight days in the same place against the same athletes in just multiple events over and over again yeah it's definitely a tiring meet for our our athletes but we do so much training all year mm-hmm. that they're prepared when they get there um, F and M is a nice warm up kind of test event cause it is a two and a half day meet versus a four day meet. 
And honestly, the the four day format will actually be a little easier for our athletes than the two and a half day format we do there because they're going to have the longest relay the first night that gets that event out of the way. And then it allows them to spread their individual events out over those next three days along with the relay so that instead of, you know, racing three to five times per day, they're racing one to two mm. times per day. Talk us through a little bit of, of what the format is for these the, this, these big championship meets, these four-day meets, when you can't have every team in the pool at one time. You can't have, you know, when it, when it, like when it's a, a dual meet and, and you have three lanes apiece, you can't have a situation like that. What is kind of the format over these big four-day weeks or these four-day meets? How does it work? Yeah, well, St. Mary's is actually unique in that they have a, a 50-meter pool and another 25-yard pool. Um, so they have tons of lane space. So we have the eight lanes that we race in, and we, we swim into a bulkhead, which is actually nice for us because it's faster. It allows the water to rush through that wall where the flip turns are happening instead of having the water bounce back at you. And then on the other side of that bulkhead, there's about 15 lanes for the six different teams that are there to use for warm up and warm down. And then there is that other separate 25 yard pool um, for additional warm up, warm down space. So it's actually the facility is really great for the size of our conference. It makes sure that the athletes have enough space to get ready for their races. And then after their races to hop in and cool out, cool down and flush their systems out before they get ready for that next race. Um, so we're really fortunate in that regard that we do have so much space. And um, obviously you do want your athletes getting into that championship competition pool um, during the warm-up so they can get used to their flip turns on the bulkhead um, and just get used to what it's going to be like. Depth of the water can sometimes throw you off if you haven't been diving into that or turning into that. So um, we'll spend lots of time in the warm-up pool on Thursday and then, again, their next three days as, as we get ready for each day's championship events. It, it's also different in the sense of uh, you, you mentioned that there is the the warm up pool and everything that you'll have uh, the accessibility to, but there may be athletes that that go a lot longer in terms of, of length of time between one event to the next event or or even days. Is there anything different that you have to do or have your athletes do to keep themselves warm and can keep themselves ready for for their next event? Should they maybe go you know early in the afternoon in one event and late in the afternoon during the same session in the next event. Is there anything different that you have to do to keep them ready? No, we pretty much have the same meet warm up that we go over um, all season long. So the same warm up they do at the start of a dual meet, everyone will do whether they have races that day, just to keep them in that mindset and mentality of I'm, I'm ready to race. Um, and then before their actual event, most of our athletes will get back in and, and do a little bit shorter of a warm up just to get ready and, and get their heart rate up and get, get some speed work in. Um, so it's a little bit different, um, but pretty much all year is geared towards prepping for this meet and they know what to do when we get there and, and they'll have their routine ready to go. Being that this, this is a, a full CAC meet, you've, you've kind of got an idea of, of what you're facing, the other teams that you're going up against at this capital athletic conference championship. What do you, what do you hope to see? What are your, your goals for your team as, as a whole, both the men and the women's side? What do you hope to get out of this event and, and where do you hope to place? Yeah, for us, it's been nice to, to have the opportunity to race everybody in the conference throughout the year and kind of see where each team's at and follow them along throughout the season. Um, my hope is on both sides that every single individual is going to score points for us um, in their individual events. Um, which is a huge progression for us. My first year here, we had two men score and three women score, and now we're, we're at a point where it looks like we could have all 15 men score and all 17 women score. Um, and my goal for the women is to be somewhere in that third, fourth place range this year. I think we've got a great shot at, at being competitive for third, and it's going to be really close between us and St. Mary's and Marymount. Um, on the men's side, I think we've got a great shot at fourth place. It'll be very close again between us, Marymount, and St. Mary's. So, um, We've just got to get out there and race, and, and hopefully things come up our way and, and we're able to make some team history and move up the standings. We, we kind of had a conversation before we, we got on the air here about the fact that you guys don't have a set lineup yet in, in terms of who's racing what. Is there any different thought process in a championship meet such as this that goes into who's going to be racing what event? Do you maybe mix anything up, or, or do you pretty much go with the same lineups that, that you've done for the majority of the year? Yeah, so for championships, we – score points in the top 16, um, which is different than dual meets where only the top five in each race score. Um, so we want to maximize our point potential, obviously. So we're, we entered a lot of people in more events than they'll swim. They'll only get to swim three individual events. And I have some kids entered in some anywhere from six to eight events. Um, and we got the psych sheet last week. So we've been going through that think, trying to figure out where we think other teams are going to swim their swimmers as they've over entered people as well. 
Um, and we're trying to select events where we have the best shot at being top 16 in those events for our, our team. Um, so that's the mentality is make it back for finals, either that, mm -hmm. that a final of one through eight or nine through 16 and, and score points. Of course, of course, the two primary athletes that we've focused on a lot of the year, and how can you not, are, are Christian March on the men's side and, and Macy Nitsche on the, the women's side. Uh, for, for the pair of them, this is kind of their, their going away party in a way. This is their, their last chance to swim uh, at the CACs. And what do you, based off what they've done from, from the time they've been here to now, what do you hope to see out of them in their final opportunity? in the CAC championships. Yeah. My, my hopes for them are the same for any athlete on the team. I hope they go lifetime best times. And I think they're both perfectly capable of dropping some big time in all of their races. And, um, if that leads to them winning some conference events, great. And I'd love to see them both qualify for NCAAs in their senior meet. Um, so that's kind of my ultimate hope for them is just best times across the board. And, and hopefully that leads to even better things in terms of, of events. Where do you think that your teams, men and women, may have an advantage over some of the other CAC teams. Where do you think are what are what are some of the events that you really think your team is capable of, of scoring a good amount of points? Uh, definitely on both sides, the breaststrokes um, should be strong for us. Um, the freestyle from sprint all the way to distance should be really strong on the women's side, um, along with the butterfly events for our women as well. Men's pretty similar breaststroke, like I said. Um, and then our freestyle from sprint to distance should be pretty good. Whenever you go into to kind of shaping your your relay teams in, in a situation like this, is there anything different that you look at being that it, that it's a multi day meet than than you do, or, or are you pretty much going to run with the, with the same relays and know that your your a lot of your relays have been successful this year and should be able to score you a good bit of points? Yeah, the one thing we look at at championships is. Um, with relays, an athlete can do three individual events and four relays, and there's five relays. So there's typically one relay that's not going to be as strong where, you know, all our best people can't be on all five. So we have to look at that. Um, and basically the main thing we're looking for is where do we think the other teams are going to go strong and how can we leverage that to, to maximize our placement and the relays we go strong in. All right, Justin. Well, best of luck to you and your, your teams coming up this weekend as you head down to St. Mary's County to – participate in the CAC championships and we'll talk to you again after the championships. Thanks for your time. I'm joined now for the first time on the Bobcast by women's lacrosse head coach Haley Weir. And that's just, that's still weird for me to say. I'm not, I'm not used to that. That's, it's odd to hear that. I'm used to angster still, and it's going to take me, I, I promise you throughout the year, if we do po when we do post game interviews and stuff, I'm going to call you angster at some point. So just don't get upset with it. Just accept it. It's going to happen. But so let, actually, let, let's start with that. That had to be an interesting little ride for you this year to go through from from the lacrosse season, get into summer, go through getting married and all that stuff, and and now right back into the swing of things. It had to be a, a busy, busy off season for you. It was extremely busy. Um, word of advice is probably not to get married at the end of <laughs> season so that you have some time. Um, and then we also decided to get pregnant on top of that. So well, that's the season to and that. we're due at the end of season. So it makes season very interesting, but I think it's exciting because our team is so invested in us as people and they mm -hmm. really are excited for us and yeah. everything that's changing. So well, congratulations to you and Adam both on Thank that. You. I'm sure everybody is looking forward to that. And <laughs> Your your son or daughter, whatever it's going to be, is going to have plenty of people to take care of, especially with all of your athletes, because I'm sure they're ready. They're oh, they just are. as excited as you are for yeah. that to come around. So <laughs> let's talk about some of those athletes. Let's get into that. It, it was an interesting season for you guys last year. I think you, you made some improvements in, in some key areas, but then you lost a lot of seniors. You lost a lot of players coming into this year. Uh, how do you – you can't really replace players that are gone. It's not really possible. How do you go about dealing with that transition from one year to the next year? And looking at your roster right now, you have a lot of first-year players, a lot of young athletes on this team. How do you go about shaping that roster from one year to the next with all that transition? So when we came in, this is my third season now, um, that class was by far our biggest class. There was nine of them. And knowing that they were all going to be seniors, we tried to – fix that on the other end of the recruiting side of it and recruit kind of, like you said, we can't replace them, but mm. number wise, keep our roster somewhat stable. So we ended up bringing in 10 new freshmen this year, um, which has kind of helped 
replace some of those key spots. So out of the nine that we had, seven were starters. Mm -hmm. And so our entire starting lineup is different this year, and which was kind of, again, a pushback to our freshmen of this is an exciting time. And if you want to get some playing time and you want that starting position, it's open and available if you mm -hmm. put in the work behind it. And I think that a lot of them have really started to see that as we're getting close to games and have started to pick up some movement and hopefully that – consistency will now pick up and then we can keep this class of 10 over the next four years and gain consistency as we move along and their skills will only get better. Well, and let's kind of take a look at the, the roster position by position here and get a little breakdown. You lose, we'll start at the back with, with your goalkeeping situation. You, you lose a, a starting keeper in, in Dylan Teitelbaum and, and your two, your two options now, Abigail McClure and Emily Mayo are, are really going to fight for that, that starting role, a junior and a sophomore. Title Bomb was a very good keeper for you guys. How do you look to to move, and what's that competition look like between those two girls? Dylan was an exceptional goalie. Um, I think that she made a big impact on our team with leadership, and I think she made a big p impact on our team throughout with the CAC. And I think that having Emily and Abby kind of watch her last year and now Abby for two years and learn some of the things that did work and some of the things that didn't work, I think that it's given them some time. And now that they have the opportunity to kind of fight for that position, and I think that they're ready for it. And I think that they're excited to kind of have that opportunity now to – be our starting keeper and to take control back there and have that leadership spot. And so what we've seen in practice and preseason is really both of them stepping up. And I think that it's going to be a continuous kind of battle over the next couple weeks and months of who's ready and who really has the consistency to kind of continue in that starting position. And I think one of the places then that you, you kind of have some spots already solidified from a year ago is on that on that defense with, with, with Sam Cataldo coming back and, and Lachelle Coates as well. So a couple spots up for grabs there, but it's got to kind of feel nice that you have some solidity at the back knowing that you have a couple girls back that were, were consistent players for you a year ago. Yes, Sam and Lachelle have taken great leadership strides back there, and I think that last year really helped. And then, unfortunately, last year when we had our other two starting defenders who got injured um, through the year, then they were out. So it kind of gave them a taste of – their own medicine of what they were getting into from that leadership role. And I think it's just rolled right over right. now with new freshmen coming in. One of the places that there is going to be a lot of transition this year is in that midfield. You lose Amani Bird, who was a consistent player for you. You lose the Hart Twins. It, you lose Haley Hines. You lose Alyssa Barlow, who played some of the midfield, some of the defense for you. And it's it's kind of right now looks to be a bit of an open competition from a lot of uh, with a lot of girls fighting for those spots. How do you feel about where your team stands right now in terms of your midfield depth going into the new season? I think that the idea of it is really trying to find the right players and the right fit for what they do. Um, so Jess Hartley is going to be a big help for us in taking the draw. I don't know if she'll necessarily play midfield the entire time both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the part of trying to find their strengths and weaknesses and what we can really use with this team as our entire midfield is new. Um, I think we have a couple freshmen that are stepping up and that are ready to run both and have done really well in practice. And um, can handle that, and I think that we're just trying to figure out a good group of three that we can kind of get some consistency mm -hmm. in there to rise above. Um, last year, it was a struggle the same way with Amani. She was all, I'm a defender, I'm a defender, I'm not going to play midfield, <laughs> and we turned around and we're like, yes, you are, and <laughs> she did phenomenal. So I think that it just kind of needs to find the right fit yep. and to really give them some confidence back there that they can do it. Uh, the other interesting question that comes to – to the forefront with this team is is where's the goal scoring going to come from this year not only as i mentioned do you lose the heart twins who, who were prolific scorers for you a season ago uh due to, to issues that are beyond anyone's control nikki halkius no longer is no longer here uh so you lose your leading goal scorer from a year ago and somebody's got to pick up that production luckily for you you have a candidate in my opinion in morgan cavey that that did a very good job last year and should be able to pick up a lot of that scoring uh for your team this season but you still got to find some other options that can't fall on the shoulders of one player 
So Morgan is, I mean, she's a phenomenal attacker. I think that she's just a great kid all around and her leadership skills on attack and on the entire team have just exceeded my expectations this year. And so she has really taken a lot of that under her own wing and said like, yes, this has happened. And yes, our team's very different than last year, but that doesn't mean that we can't be just as good as we were and if not better. So she's taken a lot of these freshmen that I think have the skill behind it, but just need a little confidence and trying to figure mm -hmm. out their place on the team and how they all fit together. And so what we, with our past scrimmage this weekend, I think that it was a good taste for them to see that they can work together and that they can rely on Morgan to kind of be there as the backbone, but that they all have to contribute to the team on attack. And mm -hmm. there's a couple good candidates that I'm excited to see where they go. Well, you, so you lose a pair of twins, you lose... <laughs> You lose the Hart twins. Well, you gain another set of sisters this year as, <laughs> as Morgan's sister Summer comes in. And that's got to be just an interesting situation. And what's kind of the dynamic been with, you know, you have the twins here with the Hart twins and, and they're the same age. Well, but well, Morgan's been here for a couple of years. Now she has her sister Summer here. Has she been kind of like a mentor to Summer? Or has it kind of been back to the whole, you know, it's a sibling rivalry. I'm going to pick on you a little bit sort of thing. What's that kind of kind of been like coaching the two of them together? They definitely have a special bond. Um, Summer is just as independent as Morgan is on the field. And so I think that Morgan is there as a mentor. But I think that Summer is a personality that doesn't necessarily need her sister to <laughs> pat her on the back all the time. Um, she's taken matters into her own hands and has solidified a start spot for us and she really is going to be a big contributor and I think just having that connection with Morgan mm -hmm. is helpful um, to know that she's back there and that she has support but it's it's interesting and pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so going into this season then let, let's let's kind of take a look at at the landscape of the Capital Athletic Conference. This is, is known around the country as being one of the best lacrosse conferences at the Division Three level that there is and it, it doesn't look to be any different going into the 2018 season. There are some absolute dominant programs in this conference. It's going to be a tough year again. It's, mm -hmm. it's always a tough year in the CAC. As a coach, what is your outlook and, and what do you think about the conference as a whole and where do you think you guys stack up in the pecking order? So the Capital Athletic Conference, like you just said, is really well known in lacrosse. And I think that that's part of what drew me here as a coach and part of why we um, get some of the recruits that we do is because you want to play against the best. And we mm. do. We play against the best. And that is really exciting for us. Um, going into each season of how do we stack up and where do we fit in and how do we kind of challenge and rise above. So we've always kind of fell in the middle of that group um, and we're always fighting for a playoff spot. And I think that that is well known on our team. And I think that's a goal that we set every year is to make it to the CAC playoffs. And then that happened last year and now it's to make it to the next round. So I think we keep kind of chipping away as we move forward, but it is tough and we know that. And so mm -hmm. we try to help with the rest of our schedule to kind of prepare for teams like that and then also kind of balance out a little bit. So it's it's interesting, but it's it's great to play against yeah. the best and get the best competition out there. And you do have some some very difficult games in the non-conference schedule. Of course, that starts this upcoming weekend with Randolph-Macon. We'll dive more into that game in just a minute. But when you, you go down the list of, of your opponents, West Virginia, Wensley, and Washington, and Jefferson, Susquehanna, Bridgewater, Goucher, Lynchburg, you even – play hope a, a team out of out of holland michigan uh in the in the uh, in the uh the non-conference schedule that one down in hilton head south carolina it looks like this year you've gone out and kind of tried to challenge your team in the non-conference schedule to 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 get ready for what is going to be an extremely difficult conference schedule when it comes around so we do like to keep a couple in there we've always kind of opened up around with randolph macon and i think that's a good game for mm -hmm. us um they sit at the top of the odak with washington and lee and i think that that's just another competitive game that gets us a little bit more excited for where we're going um we also just open and scrimmage against washington college and so that's another great team that plays more like the rest of our conference does and so so if we can play against some of those teams and um, challenge ourselves a little bit more, it's only going to help us in the CAC when we get there. It also doesn't hurt that one of your assistant coaches is a Randolph-Macon alum. Mm -hmm. Of course, Katie Russo, a graduate of Randolph-Macon, so keeping that game on the schedule, I'm, I'm sure it's tough for her to go back and forth <laughs> in that one. But she, of course, now is a Frostburg State Bobcat and has to deal with it <laughs> that way. But last year, Randolph-Macon, uh, when, when you took on the Yellow Jackets, they got the better of you. It was, it was a 20-11 to 11 loss. What do you expect to see different this year from Randolph-Macon than you did a year ago? And where do you think you guys have improved from that game last season to this season that you can give them a run for their money? 
Last season, um, I don't think that we were as prepared with a scrimmage before and getting ready and kind of working out the kinks. Um, this year with Washington, like I said, I think that that was a good competition of more like our conference and getting kind of the kinks out. And we saw some good things. We saw some things we need to work on. And to have a full week to prepare for this upcoming first game, I think is exciting for us to work out those kinks and get on the same page and make sure that we are ready when that time comes. So this being the first game of the season, you do have that scrimmage, but it's it's not as a, as competitive of a game as an actual an actual game will be. What do you hope to see out of your squad, an extremely young squad that that can tell you that your team is headed in the right direction? I think that confidence is the biggest thing, regardless of what happens, knowing that they're in it together and that they're all on the same page and that everyone's going through what we're telling them to do and that it's together, I think, is the biggest thing of just knowing that if the game goes one way or the other, that that just sets the tone for where we're going in the next couple games. And so to see them end on a high note, regardless of the score, but is more of we played well and we played our game and we're working on what we want to work on. We, I mean, we understand where we are. We're a young team. There's 10 new players. We implement a couple of new sets on attack. We've implemented a couple of new sets on defense. And so that's always new. And so to kind of get that confidence in this first game and feel comfortable enough that that sets the tone and that we'll be ready as we move through season is what's expected well Haley best of luck to you coming up on Saturday best of luck to your squad and best of luck to you throughout the whole year we'll talk to you again next week thanks for joining me thanks so I'm joined now on the podcast by head men's lacrosse coach Tommy Pierce coach it was a, a nice way to start the season for your team against a, a your an Arsinus squad that looked like a, a tough competition on paper it was a very very close game a team that got the the better of you a year ago first off let, let's talk about the game it's itself and you had to take a lot of positives from this game, both offensively, defensively, in goal. You had a, a first-year score, four goals for you. All in all, you got to be extremely happy with the performance. Yeah, for sure. You know, that's uh, we've only played our sinus three years now, but I think it's developed into a pretty good rivalry. Mm -hmm. You know, we've won it by one goal a couple times, and, and they got us by two last year. So it's really been uh, a great game on our schedule, schedule and one we hope to keep for a long time. Um, yeah, I think there were good things on, every, on you know all over the field. You know, definitely Jack Marks played great in cage, and uh, it was great to see a freshman, you know, have such a a, a big first day. Um, you know, defensively, we think we played really, really well, especially off ball. I think a lot of the goals we gave up were unassisted goals, so maybe you know, we're going to take a little bit of a look at that on film. Um, and our face-off, you know, I, I think our, our, we, we didn't win the face-offs, but I think we really scrapped off the wings, and that was a real positive for us, too. We were a little concerned about face-offs going into that game. Of course, Jason Clinton is that first year that scored the four goals. Is it something that, that you expected from him right off the bat coming in? You knew he was probably a talented player, but did you expect that kind of output from a first year right off the bat? Uh, Jason has great hands, and he's a great finisher. So I think that, um, you know, he didn't have to create those opportunities for himself so much as that when he – had the ball passed to him close to the cage, he was able to finish. So I think, uh, you know, he had a couple great, great um, assists from uh, Justin Carroll on, on two of those. Uh, Adam Gross found him on the backside in transition. And the fourth one isn't jumping in my head right now. But I know three <laughs> of those looks to him were, were all great looks. Uh, I'm sure the fourth one was too. Jason Clinton with four that day. Keegan Colgrove with a pair picking up where he left off a year ago. Paul Rupert with one. Justin Justin Carroll with one. And Jimmy Lucas with one. So he was the primary focus offensively. Justin Clinton was, but Jason, you, Clinton. Jason Clinton make it. Justin they're all, Clinton. They're all Justin, Justin Carroll, Carroll, Jason Clinton. Clinton they're right. all mixing together. Yeah. Um, he was the primary focus offensively. Of course he's going to be with four goals, but – it wasn't all on his shoulders, and it looks right now with the way it stands after just, just one game in that offensively you're going to be pretty deep this season and have, have the ability to score from multiple areas. Yeah, you know, I think one – Ursinus is very um, deliberate about substituting offensive and defensive middies, so we were able to uh, kind of match feet with them and, and play our first midfield line a lot, uh, which was you know good for us. I think our, we got a couple – uh, young guys on that second midfield line that um, we're going to keep working with so that, you know, in a game where we maybe can't substitute as deliberately, our second midfield line's a little bit more ready to go. But, um, yeah, I think that first midfield line did great. And, you know, Keegan ran midfield with that line until last season. So he's real comfortable with Jimmy and, and Adam. So um, th that that helped for sure. You know, I think uh, we, we might need a little more depth at the defensive midfield because subbing O middies for D middies with them. I know Brian Kolonsky was – beat at the end of the game and and, and um, mm -hmm. 
Taylor McVean pretty pretty tired too, so we'd like to have a little more depth there. And, I, of course, I didn't get to see the game. I was here in, in Bobcat Arena with the two basketball games, but our right. Andy Stanko had the game. And, and from talking to him, it, it seemed like Jack Marks had himself a very, very good game in net. And he seems like he's he's ready to really – he had a very good freshman year. He seems like sure. he's really ready to break out in his sophomore season. Are you expecting big things of him in his second year in the program? For sure. You know, I, I think um, he, he's got a whole year under his belt. You know, I think he, he's really – uh, more confident I and mean, he even told me he's kind of a little more relaxed in the clearing game now and he's a little more confident you know getting the ball out quicker we had a few um, a couple transition goals you know one was directly off of uh, a, a clear uh, we did fail a couple clears but I think when you watch the film it was a little bit more you know some mistakes and catching and throwing some things we think we can fix um, but yeah you know he, he's always been a good stopper he's going to continue to be a good stopper he's developing into you know a little bit more of a leader getting a little more vocal in the cage um, and I think he thinks that clearing is where he's going to really mm. pick a step this year for us. After one game, of course, you are only one game into your season. Going off of that that opener, is there anything that, that you feel you learned about this team that you're better somewhere, maybe not as deep somewhere as you thought, something that you learned about your squad after one game into the season that, that you didn't really know just from the preseason uh, workouts and, and scrimmages and all that stuff that you, you may have learned from that first game? Yeah, I, I think uh, – you know, last year we struggled with zone offense a little bit, and, and we saw some zone against our sinus. Um, I think we left some opportunities on the field. Uh, I think we had some openings with our zone, but we still need to keep getting better at zone offense. Um, you know, we were a little concerned, like I said, about our, our face-off situation, but I think we just need to really, really get our wing guys involved and believe that those guys you – know, we, we're going to win face-offs this year as a, a face-off unit, not just kind of the way we've been able to in the past with some guys that won those one-on-one -on -one matchups and got the ball themselves. Um, so we're going to keep working on our midfield unit, you know, um, but aside from that, you know, I think we were just really happy with, with, uh, w with having 12 turnovers and not, you know, yeah. 16, 17, 18 turnovers. <laughs> I think that was really what the, the, the big thing there for us was we took care of the ball a little better than we had in the fall and, and in our spring scrimmage. You say that, that you're, you're primarily going to win probably face-offs by committee this year. You had one guy last year, uh, Kyle Horak, who, sure. was, who was a senior last year, who's gone, who took the, the majority of your face-offs. He really was a, a face-off specialist. Right. How difficult is it to, to take that position on the field, especially where that starts the entire offense, that starts the entire rush, winning those face-offs, right. and find the guys who, who can fill that role with, with a guy who, who did it so successfully as Kyle gone. Right, and Kyle, Eric Geiser, Billy Lark, we, we've been very fortunate in that position for a long time. Um, and Sam Natvig, you know, was the guy that last year um, had the most face-offs returning to the roster. He's been hurt all preseason, so we think that, you know, hopefully we can get Sam healthy, and he's going to help us out there a lot. Uh, you know, Drew Mash is a junior that's faced off sparingly a little bit. He was kind of our main guy. Um, uh, Matt, Matty Pagliaro, a freshman, got in there. He went two for four. Uh, but I think really what, what we're trying to do right now is, is uh, just make sure we can make it a ground ball that our, our wing guys can fight. We think Greg Giles, I think Greg had four ground balls. Nick Mattis had a few. Um, we're putting Bradley Jones and Dante York up on the wings uh, to get some poles and just try to, you know, find a way to win it. So we're, we're, we're going to, like I said, we're going to keep working there, you know what I mean? And if we can't win those face-off matchups because our face-off guys just win it to themselves and, that's that's the answer, you know, to not let the other guy win <laughs> yep. it so fast, maybe. And and you know, our sinuses guy did win a lot out the front, and um, they got an early goal, I believe, with him pushing it. So um, we're gonna keep working hard there for sure. We need to keep getting better. This weekend, you you kind of have a short week, only one game uh, this week, and it comes up on Saturday when you you travel to Franklin and Marshall. Franklin and Marshall is a game that your your squad won a year ago, a nine to eight victory uh, against the Diplomats. A game that, again, should be a nice little benchmark to, to see where your team currently stands. And, and again, a, a difficult matchup. How do you how do you feel going into this game that you match up with, with Franklin and Marshall as you stand right now? Right, yeah. That, last year, that was a crazy game. And actually, I think from the time the first whistle started, it, we had two lightning delays. So I think the game <laughs> took about five and a half, six hours, actually. Uh, really weird game, in and out a few times. Um, you know, we think the strength of our team returning is our, our defense. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Franklin Marshall has you know, one of the best attack units in the country. So I think that's going to be, you know, um, they're Monahan and Rogers. Uh, I think they, they have a new guy. They graduated a guy last year. But, you know, Joey Lucas on, on Monahan was a really good matchup last year. And uh, we had a few different guys on, on Rogers. But I think that, you know, we're, we're going to have to keep their attack in check uh, to be in that game. And I believe even last year, their faceoff guy was great. He really dominated us on faceoffs last year. And we were happy to. Uh, you know, shoot a pretty high percentage in that game to kind of – we kind of got out, outplayed in a lot of facets. So uh, we hope we can play them a little bit more evenly um, and not have to rely um, 
on just kind of scoring a, a lot of goals and, and fewer possessions like we did last year. So we're hoping we can play them a little bit more straight up. Um, and that would be a great win. You know, they're, they're a great team. I don't think they lost after we beat them until they lost in the NCAA tournament. I think they went, they won, they won like the next 16 games or something like that. So uh, <laughs> they definitely got it figured out after yeah. us last year. Yep. No, knowing that, that this is pretty much the same schedule that you had to start the year uh, a year ago, you look back on it from now to, to a year ago. If you were coming into this game last year compared to now, where do you think your team stands currently compared to where it was at this point one year ago? Sure. I think, um, you know, defensively, like I said, I think we've, we've got a lot of the same guys back. We're playing defense about the same way. But I think, you know, eight of our nine goals on Saturday were assisted. And that's uh, a whole different mindset for our offense. You know, we're definitely sharing the ball more, believing in each other a little bit more. I think last year guys were trying to, you know, score a lot of goals one-on-one -on -one and, get, and get the goals. They felt like they had to do everything single-handedly when the ball was in their stick. And I think we've really been trying to get guys believing that we're, we, we have a, a good unit and we can share the ball and we can dodge hard and move the ball and, you know, you, you can get it back. You don't have to score when it's in your stick. So I think offensively we're we're playing a little bit different. We're, we're playing some better team offense, and I think I feel really good about that right now. Looking at this this game on Saturday, looking at what Franklin and Marshall brings to the table, do you think there's anything that you, your team needs to do differently to win on Saturday than they did last year against the squad? No, I mean, I, I, we'd like to win some more face-offs than we did against them last year for sure. Um, you know, but, but I think I know that was one of Jack's best games last year as a freshman. He, he mm -hmm. came up huge, and I think without Jack last year, we probably wouldn't have pulled that one out. So hopefully we can not have to rely on, on Jack saving as many. Um, for us to be in the game, you know, we can do a little bit better uh, everywhere so that we don't, you know, like I said, rely, rely on the things we had to rely on like last year. Like when you look at the score last year after that game, it was kind of shocking to look at the stats and then yeah. see that we won by one. So, um, like I said, if we, I think if we can play them a little more straight up, then we don't, you know, we, we don't have to, like I said, we can hopefully not have to rely on making a million saves and scoring on like all of our offensive possessions. It was a little bit, you know, a little bit interesting game last year. So hopefully it'll be more of a kind of an evenly matched game all over the field yep. all right well tommy thanks best of luck to you on saturday and we will talk to you again next week i'm joined now on the bobcast by head softball coach wes landrum coach coming back from the salem invitational over the weekend down in winston salem north carolina and we'll, we'll get to the games individually here in a second but you go two and two over the weekend you, you beat a team once you lose to a team once in brandeis and then you split it between salem a loss with salem a win over shenandoah Knowing that this is a very new team for you, a very young team, a lot of, of new acquisitions to this squad, how do you judge the overall performance splitting your series over the weekend two and two? Uh, to me, it's about growth. Um, you know, splitting is a, is a little bit different. I think we, we lost two on Saturday. Um, we didn't play particularly well in really any facet of the game. Being able to see that growth from Saturday night to Sunday morning was a huge thing for us as a coaching staff to see them be able to handle that adversity and be able to to, to fix some mistakes that we made and, and to come out and, and look so much better on Sunday was uh, was encouraging for us. Th those two games on Saturday, let's start with those two, Brandeis an 11-5 to loss, uh, Salem 10 uh, nothing loss. What do you think was was really the issues with your club in that in those first two games? It's I, I think you can kind of attribute part of it to, to, to it being a lot of new players, but you do have some returners. What were the big issues that, that you felt your team faced in those first two openers? Yeah, I mean, I think um, so many so many new faces, <clears throat> excuse me, to replace, you know, six starters is, is was unique to us. And, and finding kids who um, weren't nervous, I, I would say, was, was, was difficult. I think that, you know, we showed that we were nervous in a lot of different facets of the game. And I think that instead of playing fast and free, we played a little slow and nervous. And so I think, um, you know, part of the result is, is it comes from that not, uh, not being able to sort of slow the game down a little bit. And, and the more you are nervous and, and rightfully so, a lot of kids playing their first, you know, collegiate games and, and, it, and it's a little nerve wracking and, and, uh, you know, didn't get any little breaks, any little helps early on, um, didn't make a couple plays, and, and I think that added to a little bit to the adversity factor and, mm -hmm. and uh, it kind of built up and not in a positive way. So I think, you know, um, the, the ability to settle in a little bit, we, we didn't have that advantage on Saturday that we've had in the past, um, but with a lot of new faces, you know, I, I think it's a little bit expected. And I think you can say that, that some of your new newcomers over the weekend 
really did have some some strong performances. Uh, one that comes to mind, Sam Carver had a, a three-hit outing. Caitlin Merling, uh, she had a nice day as well uh, on Sunday. Some of these these newcomers really did show over the weekend that, that they belong here at Frostburg and are going to be key contributors for you going forward. Oh, most definitely. I think, um, you know, a lot of these kids need opportunities and, and um, the ability to get outside and, and, and show it um, was key. Um, I, we have a lot of good pieces. We're still trying to find, you know, the best fit for a lot of them. Um, got a lot of good contributions from a, from a lot of kids. Um, you know, I think uh, just the effort from, from day one to day two was was so much better in a lot of different ways that – you know, it, it's uh, it's it's exciting for me because you know, we, like I said, we I, I feel like we, we thought we could play that way Saturday, we didn't. But the, when we did come out and play that way on Sunday, it was pretty encouraging. One uh, other player that I, w- I want to mention is Taylor McCarty. She had a home run in one of those games as well. So a lot of newcomers really stepping up for you. One player that I, I want to really focus on is in terms of your returners is Allison Short. She had a, a little bit of struggles on Saturday. Something that that you're really not accustomed to seeing uh, from a player of her caliber, but then she turned it around and really turned it on against Shenandoah, a shutout performance against the Hornets. What did you see different from her from, from day one? Was it maybe a little of a new season jitters for her to come back and have a performance like she did against Shenandoah? What, what, kind of, what was her demeanor between the two days? Um, if you've ever met Allison Short, you know she's one of the most competitive people you'll ever meet, and the fact that – um, she was not happy with her performance on Saturday. <laughs> um, I think if you had expected anything less from her on Sunday, you're, you're silly or haven't watched this play. Um, <laughs> that's my expectation um, for her. That's her expectation for herself. Um, I, you know, I can't really tell you what was wrong on Saturday. I mean, the weather was, was not the greatest. Um, it, it's not great to, to see dirt for the first time and it be 40 and rain, um, which didn't help. And, 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 you know, this is a bunch of new catchers for her. Um, which is a big thing, and it's them learning our pitchers and, and our pitchers throwing to them, and it's a comfortability issue. We knew we were going to deal with it. Um, you know, and it, it just didn't go well on Saturday for whatever reason, a, lo- a lot of different things. Um, but I, I think, you know, her, her ability to bounce back is something that is she's proven throughout her career here that um, I, I don't know that you can go back and ever see that she's had back-to-back poor outings. Mm-hmm. Um, not that you can go back and find <laughs> a lot of poor outings for her. Um, She's a fantastic, uh, you know, kid and softball player, and I think, um, you know, her her ability to 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 handle adversity has always been one of her greatest qualities. And I I want to I want to touch on that for a second. The fact that she she used or she had to she had to throw to so many different catchers. It was pretty consistent last year. You had Ray Harrison behind the plate. Sure. She was your starting catcher for no matter who was pitching. For the most part, this time around over the weekend, your, your pitchers are throwing to three different catchers. What? How long does it take for for a battery to really create that chemistry? And you know, you you know, as a pitcher, that if you throw a wild pitch, if you throw something in the dirt, that, that your catcher's there to block you. It's got to be a whole different atmosphere, a whole different mindset, knowing that your catcher, who you've been dealing with for the past couple of years, is no longer back there. I mean, it still comes back to comfortability. Mm-hmm. Um, it's time, you know. Um, we we've had a fall and a three week. <laughs> um, you know, three weekish preseason, so I think uh, it, it'll continue to get better. But I, it's it's a trust, it's a trust mm-hmm. issue, and I think um, you know n- having new kids behind the plate is exciting for us. Um, you know, um, but at the same time, it's it's a little daunting for for a kid who's been here with the same catcher for mm-hmm. for three years. I think you know she's the one who suffers a little bit more than the other kids because the other kids, all the other girls, are new to the program. So it's it's not a comfortability issues much for them as it is for her but I, I think uh, you know I, I think definitely there's um, some really good progress so. let's let's talk about things off the field for a little bit you you go down to Winston-Salem North Carolina that's your openers as your first four games of the season but on top of playing four games down there it probably was a, a pretty nice getaway for your team as well and a nice way to bond a nice way to build some team chemistry both on the field and then off the field all the time that you get to spend with each other on the road trip in the hotel, all of that stuff. It had to be nice to just get down there and create some team chemistry on a nice little road trip to start things off. I mean, yeah, as we talk about all the time, like uh, our chemistry, you know, really hits full bore, you know, typically that first or second week of March once we've been on the road a few times and uh, kids get used to each other and, and, and uh, you know, find find what they like and don't like. And, 
and just be around each other and enjoy each other's company. And mm -hmm. it's it's great to – it's forced on them, you know, when you're on a six-and-a-half-hour bus ride. Um, there's no escape. Um, you know, you, you find out a, a lot of stuff about a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think those that's what's great for our from a chemistry standpoint, um, you know, is that y you do have the ability to, to do these things early in the season, and it, and it does pay dividends down the road. One other spot on the field that I want to talk about it is – the chemistry that, that has to be created between the middle of an infield. Last year, you had such a consistent middle infielding, you know, middle infield pairing. This year, you had to kind of switch it up. Two players gone, two graduations. This year, you have an entirely new center of the diamond. When you look at a lot of the time, you played Olivia Ford and, and Kat Tariff. How long does it take for, for, for a pair like that to to create the chemistry that is needed in the middle of the infield to know who's where at the right time and, and all of the facets that go into playing that center of the diamond, probably the most important spot defensively on the entire field. Um, well, I'll just correct you. It's Kat Treff. Treff. Sorry. Um, it, yeah, it's, 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 it's doing your job, no, knowing, trusting that the other person's doing their job. Um, it takes time. I think they did very well. Um, both of them, um, you know, starting new, this season and in and, and all four games, they were, they were there. I think it's just a, it's a good building block. You know, Olivia has been in the program for two years. Um, she's, she's a super athletic, talented kid. And so I think, uh, you know, although she's new to the position, she's not new to us. We, we know how good she is and can be, um, you, you know, obviously the, you know, Megan and Emily who were there for f mm -hmm. basically four years, um, you know, for four years, it's, it's something you take for granted and, and sort of working back and, you know, this year with, with new kids, it, it's something that, you know, it does take time and something that we've taken for granted because we haven't had to worry about chemistry. Um, but I think they did fantastic this weekend. Megan Tracy and Emily Zengel, of course, you, you mentioned the two. Those were the two. And now Megan Tracy is, is one of your assistant coaches. How has she kind of taken from that role of being a leader on the field to now being one of your coaches sitting on the bench calling the shots for the most part along with, uh, along with you? I think it's uh, – <laughs> she's done a fantastic job. I think um, – you know she's a very fiery individual, and I think uh, her competitiveness comes through. She's uh, gets super excited. Um, she's always been that way, and so I think uh, you know it rubs off on those kids when they see her excitement and her getting. Uh, um, you know, kids are getting hits, and she's you know jumping up and down for them in the dugout. And I think that's you know that's what she did as a player. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think uh, her energy level translates very well to those to those new kids. Do you think that? there's a comfortability factor with her being in the dugout as well for a lot of these kids that sure. have played with her for four years. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I think they feel comfortable going to her and asking her questions. Um, you know, she's been around me for, obviously this is year five now, so she understands the expectations from me and I think, uh, she's, she's easy to talk to. So yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a very wonderful, you know, comfortable piece. Now you, you, you get a week off your original schedule had you playing Randolph Macon this coming weekend, things get shifted around. You're actually going to play Randolph Macon the following weekend on March 3rd. So you get into the swing of things, then you get an entire week off. Is that difficult as a coach to deal with, to, to know, well, we just got started, now we have this entire week where we can just go practice again, not actually be on the diamond. Is it hard to deal with, or do you enjoy having this week off? Normally I would say I would not enjoy it. I think um, once you start playing, I think you really want to keep in the rhythm of playing. Um, I'll say a little bit different this year just because – I think we zeroed in on some things we really need to work on, and I and I think I'll appreciate the extra week to sort of fix those things. Um, you know, obviously, us getting outside is is a huge part of it. Um, our our locale and our climate don't always aren't conducive <laughs> at the end of February. So I mean, I think, you know, getting an extra week is 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 going to be, you know, beneficial from a standpoint of being able to 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 correct some of the things that I feel like we can sort of fine tune some things that that may have been lacking a little bit. So. Well, Wes, fantastic. Good opening weekend for your girls. Get a week off now, and best of luck to you next week. We'll talk to you next Monday. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it.